represented in the book Ar uh, Feminism and Art History that is on the reading list. And that, is, um, that has two very crucial articles. So if you manage to get a hold of that book, at least glance at the, at the pictures that I'm going to talk about, you will get a better sense. I'm not going to analyze the pictures, but just mention them as a case, OK? So today and the next session will be on the relation between viewing and then voyeurism on the one hand and the narratological concept of focalization on the other. So viewing with one leg into narratology and one leg into pornography or whatever you want to call it, which is kind of weird combination, but you'll see that it is going to help us to make sense of the question, what makes a narrative and a painting erotic, voyeuristic, and what uh, doesn't? Because it's not the case that every evocation of a, a female body is necessarily erotic or pornographic. And we, I think we, it's uh, important to, this, to try to be a little subtle about those issues. And that's why uh, I wanted to relate this question of the viewer to both of those two things to try to make uh, kind of a methodological argument for how to analyze this. Now, um, so these two sessions are going to be on that question. It's not going to be a general theory of viewing. Keep that in mind, because there are a lot of aspects to viewing, and some of them will come back in later sessions that have nothing to do, or not clearly anything to do with the question of uh, erotic viewing. That is, in fact, basically what is at stake here. Now, um, in this essay that I mentioned in the, in the course description, Artemisia and Susanna, which is really a classic of feminist art history, if you want to get a sense of serious, solid, good art history and serious, solid, good feminism together, this is the essay to read. It is a seminal essay, an essay by Mary Garrett or Garrett. Mary Garrett there makes a case for the attribution of the painting Susanna and the Elders of um, probably 16, 1619, but it may even be earlier, to Artemisia Gentileschi rather than to her father and teacher Orazio Gentileschi. You can imagine that if a daughter, especially in times where women were not so much supposed to do these things, if a daughter works under her father, that there can be a lot of confusions and a tendency then to attribute the wonderful paintings to the father and the weaker paintings to the daughter <coughs> are, of course, very clear, uh, very obvious. Now, uh, Gerard makes a case for the attribution of this painting that I cannot show you, but that is really a very strong, powerful painting, to Artemisia, and even that, if, if that is a, a justifiable attribution, as I think it is, it would be her earliest painting, very early painting. Now, Garrett begins by exposing that the painting has indeed been attributed to, earlier to Artemisia, mainly on the basis of biographical data. So her argument is, has external support. The date and signature inscribed in the painting have been confirmed, and hence the painting must be the earliest preserved painting of Artemisia, done at the age of 17. Now, it's a very powerful painting. You'll see if you look in the book. Yet dissident views are still heard somehow difficult to accept that this powerful painting can be such a young work of a um, kind of minor painter. Um, and if it is impossible in the light of the new data to attribute the work wholly to the father, there is a shift in the argument to the related argument of so far going a stylistic influence of the teacher that um, it differs only in degree from the complete attribution to the father. So say, on the one hand, trying to say that it's the father's work doesn't work anymore with the new data, but then saying, well, it's the daughter's work, but her father, in fact, dictated it to her. Now, what is new in Gerard's article and what makes it so wonderful, on the one hand, it is absolutely classical art historical iconographic reading of the painting. So it gives you, as far as you are literary students, it gives you a good sense of the traditions in that field. But um, the important, uh, the reason why it's such a wonderful article is because she doesn't um, attribute it to uh, uh, Artemisia on the basis of those data, but on the basis of the treatment of the theme 
Although the painting can be placed among a group of works, of circles in which Artemisia belongs, and you always have this kind of sense that it was a traditional theme, there is an immediately striking and decisive difference in the painting, which Gairat describes thus. The position of the arms has been decisively changed. So I'm sorry I cannot show it, but the, you see the woman uh, sitting on a bench between, uh, very close to the viewer, and then two men really threateningly above her coming from behind the bench, and she is warding them off in this kind of position. Now, the position of the arms has been decisively changed compared to the tradition and her image accordingly revised from that of a sexually available and responsive female to an emotionally distressed young woman whose vulnerability is emphasized in the awkward twisting of her body. Now here we have again a twisted body, but in this case it is not because she is not real, but because it's only too real. And this is a nice comparison since this is a female, a work of a female artist with the Rembrandt. Now, in the article immediately following Garrard's article in this volume, Frima Fox Hofrichter, another feminist art historian, makes a comparable claim about Judith Leister's painting, A Proposition. Judith Leister is one of the Dutch 17th century painters, the only woman that we know of. And the proposition is a typical genre painting where you see a woman uh, being propositioned to by a man, and in the tradition, the woman is always responsive and available. Now, the claim here does not concern the attribution of the painting, but its place within the genre to which it belongs. Hofrichter makes plausible that Leister modified the genre and set the tone for a radical reversal of its moral me message. Instead of the available woman, you get the resisting woman, the woman who is bothered by a man. You get paintings of sexual harassment rather than of sexual uh, initiative. Now, these two articles, and I must say, with um, uh, Svetlana Alpa's article in the volume, those three are, in fact, the only really challenging, interesting articles in the volume. These articles make a solidly convincing case for feminist art history's genuine and important contribution to questions of art history itself, which I think we should do in literary theory, make a good case that a feminist approach makes a contribution to the field as a whole, not only to make up for the lack of feminist insights and feminist perspectives so far, but really manages to show things in the field that uh, traditional literary theory can't. Well, of course, also more implicitly, it, these articles contribute important insights to feminist theory about the relations between gender and representation, although that remains more implicit, that is a very important contribution. Now, in both these articles, the question of authorship is modified into that of the genderedness of the image. The fact that the painters were women is a logical extension of the interpretation of the painting, rather than the other way around. Significantly, Gerard, in this Susanna and Ar Artemisia and Susanna uh, article, brings in biographical detail at the end of her argument, only supplying further evidence for a claim that was already fully argued on the basis of the image itself. And the interesting evidence she brings in that Artemisia had been raped. There's an official case that they went to court. Her father went to court. Of course, she couldn't go to court herself. Her father went to court. There was a very important case. She was tortured to get the evidence. and. Um, and there were records of that, of that court case, and that happened in the same year. Interestingly, she also did a Lucrezia 30 years later, which is very traditional and very uninteresting. And the relation between this Susanna and the rape, rather than the Lucrezia and the rape, is, is really interesting. Now, in both cases, the relation, in the case of Gerard and Artemisia, and the case of uh, Hofrichter and Leister. In both cases, the relation between the represented men and women becomes the key to the particular gender quality of the works. This becomes more, less abstract when we talk about the Rembrandts, of course. In both works, it is the direction of the eyes of the figures in relation to their bodies that constitutes the most significant aspects of the argument. The Leister painting, the proposition, represents the propositioning man as looking intensively at the woman 
while she equally intensively does not look at him. You can represent intensive non-looking in a painting. As we saw yesterday, this intensive looking at nothing in the Washington uh, Joseph. Now, in all the other pieces of the genre, in its pre lysterian form, until she intervenes with this change, the woman returns the man's looks. And in Gentileschi's Susanna, the figure turns her eyes away from her assailants, unlike most Susannas in the rich tradition, who all respond to the man's gaze in one way or another. So apparently there is something about looking and responding to looking. The entire visual tradition of the Susanna story rests on a kind of mythical work discussed in relation to Joseph and Potiphar's wife. The biblical story becomes a pretext for its radical reversal. The exemplum of chastity, as Susanna is in the biblical story, becomes the occasion for the celebration of sexual opportunity. And of course, the justification of rape is not far away. And in that respect, the Susanna tradition and the Lucretia tradition are very closely related. The tradition is characterized by the representation of, as well as used for, the pornographic situation of voyeurism. As Gerard argues, the inclusion in the image of the two literous old men make the shift, the distortion, if ever there was one, both iconographically justified and pornographically effective. That is what she says. So let's say that pornographic gaze takes its justification from a tradition that claims to be a representation of a story that is pre-established, while in fact it is the turning around of that story. See, so I'm continuing here the argument of the previous uh, discussion. Now the identification, or the juxtaposition maybe, of the represented viewer in the painting, the viewer in the painting, with voyeurism, which is also pertinent in Leister's proposition is nowhere more justified than in, the tra in this tradition where the innocent and chaste Susanna is shown, firstly, as an attractive sex object, and secondly, in the guise of an Eve, either struggling against her own impulses to sin or overtly as um, accepting the temptation. temptation. Um, of course, I'm not saying that Eve is the example of a woman struggling against her temptation and then giving in, as you can read in, in my book, Lethal Love, in the last chapter, that is not, that is again a distortion of the Eve story, but that is the Eve tradition, what it has become, of course, in the Christian um, the Western tradition. Now, insofar as any resistance or anguish is represented at all in these traditional Susanna paintings, and here again we might have one to, and maybe we can do that for next time, look up a few Susanna and the elders that are more traditional, to see the difference, like we did with the Lucretia. If you have time to do that, it would be nice. Because we are basically not going to do the visual analysis this time, but next time more. But I'm just preparing it. So insofar as any resistance or anguish is represented at all, it is largely conventional and only enhances the excitement of the two men standing in for the viewer. So there is this kind of gesture of resistance that is not serious. You know, this, this whole question of does a girl mean no when she says no? Well, some people think she means yes. And the tradition of the Susanna suggests that she means yes. Now, this is exactly what pornography does. And as we have seen earlier, this is why pornography and actual rape are so closely related. That is how the Lucretia tradition can become a justification for rape. And in fact, it is to Artemisia's experience of rape that Carrard refers to Susanna painting in the end, and not the Lucretia painting. Gerard acknowledges that there have been occasional sympathetic Susannas <coughs> in the long and almost exclusively male tradition of this subject, the sympathy consisting of some at attentiveness to Susanna's vulnerability. And she quotes Rembrandt's Susanna uh, the later, no, the earlier one. Rembrandt Susanna in Berlin, this one. Um, let me see, is this the... No, this one. She quotes this one as a sympathetic example. As the most positive in the whole tradition, 
although she also points out iconographic detail that evokes erotic association. That is the, the pose of the woman here, although she is very clearly young, vulnerable, and threatened by the men who are too close to her. Um, the, her pose is, evokes that of the Medici Venus, which is a very powerful erotic image. And therefore, she, she considers Rembrandt somewhere in between, the most sympathetic male, but still male version. Okay, I'll take it back because we, okay. Now, we can turn the light on. The question in this uh, series of two lectures will be whether Rembrandt's two paintings of Susanna, the other one is earlier, this is the later one, firmly stands in the male tradition, and if so, how? That is, to what extent is this an exception or is this a limit case of a male perspective on the story? And or whether they are rather closer to Gentileschi's work. And we can, I think we can here to try to keep that open until we have done a more detailed analysis. And then how can we assess in this respect the differences between the early and the more mature work? Artemisia Gentileschi Susanna turns away from the assailants, uh, assailants quite radically. She refuses visual intercourse, not only with the two elders, but also with the viewer. She doesn't look at either. Now, both of Rembrandt's, here we go again, Susanna do turn away from the, the assailants. And in one painting, she is still unaware of the viewers. I'm sure that you are unaware of where they are. You can hardly see them. They are kind of in the bushes there. And she is still unaware of their presence. Well, in the other one, she is already being attacked. Right? Here she's already being attacked. We have to focus a little better. In both paintings, however, she turns toward the viewer. This one, she looks at us, and here too. As for the representation of vision, then, they stand exactly between the traditional representations of the story where there is a very intensive uh, responsiveness to the male assailants and a contact with the viewer. So this stands between Artemisias on the one hand, where you don't have any con eye contact, and the traditional one. So it seems worthwhile to begin a discussion of the viewer in verbal and visual art with this emblematic case. And from that case, I will take off into, I can switch them off now, I guess. Okay, take a last look. Okay. So I want to take off in the two directions that I said. On the one hand, the ideological problem of voyeurism. On the other, the technical one of the position of the viewer related to focalization. And the two come together in two moments of these analyses. The coincidence of technical and pornographic concerns themselves which I will evoke next week, and the distinction proposed by Norman Bryson between the gaze and the glance. And I really hope that you will have time to read that article, that chapter. It's a very important, very crucial uh, piece. Now, let's now first look at the biblical story. Did you manage to read it for today? OK. So in order to assess the function and the nature of looking in the biblical story, we have to bring into consideration aspects that are mostly left out in both verbal and visual interpretations of the text. For in spite of the, and with verbal interpretations, I mean commentaries, rewritings of the story in, in other pieces of literature or criticism, and visual, of course, all these paintings. In spite of the edifying biblical context, the story is perhaps more pornographic than Gerard assumes. Gerard thinks that the biblical story is perfectly all right the exemplum of chastity, while the painting, the painterly tradition is uh, distorting it. Now, Susanna's chastity, although clearly a conspicuous theme in the biblical story, is crossed, if not overwhelmed, by another theme that we remember from Rembrandt's etching that, and uh, about Joseph and Potiphar's wife. That is, we may wonder to what extent, here again, the woman is skipped over for something that happens between men. As in all biblical stories, this, is, this one has theological, moral, and juridical themes that we must leave aside uh, for the most part. 
The text is a second or first century um, addition to the book of Daniel, and this alliance is more than relevant. It is young Daniel, the future prophet, who saves Susanna from the death penalty to which the revengeful elders had condemned her. And this is, I think, a very important theme in terms of this idea of competition between older and younger men. The relation between the elders' behavior and their position of power seems crucial. They were elected judges and often had, and you know that in ancient times often you had to be an older man to, to have access to power. There was a clear relation between power and age. They were elected judges and often held court in the beautiful garden adjo uh, adjoining the house of Joachim, Susanna's husband, because Joachim was a most respectful, uh, respected citizen and his house and garden spacious and pleasant. So there are two motivations that, uh, that relate pleasure to power. Joachim is in a position of becoming a judge himself. So not only did the elders have easy access to the place of their crime and to the object of their lustful eyes, they also had a priori the power to acquit themselves of the crime. Being judges, they were going to be the ones to pronounce about the case. Their case was made beforehand, so to speak. And this is a narrative uh, feature also in terms of tension and suspense and all that, that you, the answer to the question is in fact already posed, although then it will be reversed. Finally, and I think most importantly, the two elders were together. There were two of them. That's not a coincidence. Now, the text introduces the tension in visual terms. I quote, when the people went away at noon, Susanna used to go and walk in her husband's garden. Every day, the two elders saw her entering the garden and taking her walk, and they were obsessed with lust for her. Now, you have and here, and typically, there is this combination between iterative situation description, every day she used to, etc., and the supplies of new information obsessed with lust. That makes it unclear how, in the view of the writer, the lust of the elders began. There is no origin to this lust, narratively speaking. It is just posed at a certain point. Now, the sequence of the two sentences makes for a causal connection. And in Hebrew, uh, causal connections, in fact, are never explicit because they don't have the conjunction of, of causality. The Hebrew only has this uh, conjunction and of juxtaposition, and the reader supplies the, the logical connections. And that is an, uh, a very interesting feature of the language, which makes it very plausible that the juxtaposition, the sequentiality, in fact, of these two sentences creates a causality. So she was taking her walk, and therefore they were obsessed with lust for her. It suggests that it was because Susanna exposed herself unknowingly that they became infatuated. So far, the act of viewing does not do any harm outside the men themselves. That is, it's their problem if they were obsessed with lust. So far, the two men do not confess to each other, I quote, what pangs they suffered because they were ashamed to confess that they wanted to seduce her. Day after day, they watched eagerly to see her. So we have pangs and suffering, shame, and the possibility of confession, seduction, which is a very nice euphemism, of course, for rape. And they watched her. So the visual uh, as, a, as what triggers the desire. Now, viewing here is explicitly opposed to seduction. So they were uh, looking at her, but they did not seduce, and seduce is really a very disturbing euphemism, of course. So there is a, an opposition between viewing and rape. Let's call it rape, because that's what they had in mind, right? Now, this is indeed a common view even today. The causal connection between seeing and acting is violently denied in the pornography debate, where um, people just say, well, either it's a direct causality, and that's clearly not the case, so there is no causality. But there is a complex kind of causality, of course. It is not the case that every viewing of a desirable object leads to taking possession of that or an equivalent object, or else all consumers of pornography would be rapists. And that is simply not the case. 
we know that there are many more for your for years and viewers of pornography than there are rapists, fortunately. Yet the lack of simple causality does not mean that there is none. There is a direct relation between viewing, desiring, and the impulse to fulfill the desire. That causality is clear and it's also acknowledged. It is here that the difference comes into perspective. Every consumer of pornography who actually has a subsequent desire, let's say, which is the normal way to go, will then try to fulfill that desire. But then how? And there you have, of course, a differentiation. Now, in his essay, The Sexual Aberrations, and don't be shocked by the term, this is a 19th century term, of course, from uh, a first edition of, of 1905, Freud lists voyeurism with the perversions, but he's the first to make a very strong case, and in his age, very revolutionary case, that perversion doesn't mean anything uh, very exceptional or disturbing. But uh, what is disturbing in this essay? Did you read that essay by Freud? It doesn't speak much about uh, voyeurism, but it's nice to have it listed there in that whole category of, of uh, um, pathological uh, perversions. Now, he, li he distinguishes normal voyeurism from pathological voyeurism on the basis of the ultimate fulfillment of the desire. That is, if voyeurism does not lead to intercourse, if it not, does not function as a preliminary sexual aim, then the subject is ill. It, is, it becomes pathological if voyeurism does not lead to intercourse in Freud's. This is not to say that he means that you have to go about raping everybody you like to see, but on the contrary, that he would suggest that you, that you make looking part of the so-called foreplay of sexual pleasure rather than something that has nothing to do with it. Now, the ways in which fulfillment can be sought vary, of course, from innocent and harmless to violent and brutal criminal. This does not really solve the problem of the relation between voyeurism and rape, though. For there is, again, a difference that can emerge between the kind of desired fulfillment and the actually reached fulfillment. And it is here that most subjects make concessions. It is here, however, that some do not, and that we must therefore examine the factors which de differentiate these two categories, that is, which kind of voyeurism, which kind of these change, uh, chains between looking, touching, desiring, the desire to fulfill, and then fulfillment, which, which of these categories, some who do, do and some who don't set out to read, um, uh, if we can understand the difference, right, what, so that we can predict that in some cases you will get raped. Now, if the power to act upon the desire is one of those factors, and that is my hypothesis, that power has to do with it, if the situation is such that you can actually act, then the Susanna story can help us understand the interaction between viewing lust, power, and rape. For one thing, the relation between looking and touching is, for Freud, an inherent one. Freud says looking and touching is basically part of the same thing. And for him, looking is a derivative of touching. And therefore, looking is itself able to arouse desire because it's almost it's, it's kind of an other way of touching. But we might want to reverse this and see how touching as a, is an inherent second phase of looking, while the desire aroused by looking is generated by the perspective of touching. That is, the fact that looking creates the possibility of subsequent touching, that is, the narrative comes into play here, makes looking already enough to arouse desire. Hence, a temporal perspective has to be reckoned with, and narrative can help to see why. In the Susanna story, this scheme is followed. The viewing arouses desire, but the desire does not immediately lead to action. And here we have the question, what makes it lead to action? What's, what tips the balance? Yet, action, touching, will follow inevitably, and the, the narrative suggests that from the start. The distinction between viewing and acting is related to the solitude of the viewer. This solitude is not physical because they are together, but moral. They are ashamed of their feelings. 
It is because they do not dare confess their lust to each other that the two men refrain from acting. This situation changes when they discover each other's secret. One day they said, let's go home, it's time for lunch. This is a kind of anachronistic translation, but never mind. So they went off to the nearest McDonald's. So they went off in di different directions, but soon retraced their steps and found themselves face to face. They see each other seeing. And when they questioned one another, each confessed his passion. Then they agreed on a time when they might find her alone. Now, in Freud's view, shame, and shame is mentioned here, is the counterforce that has to be overcome in order for voyeurism and its counterpart, exhibitionism. And it's, it's important to realize that for Freud, these are kind of inherently connected to be possible at all. So there is always shame as an obstacle. According to Freud, the active and passive tendencies of what he calls perversions are two sides of the same thing. And that's kind of an interesting uh, approach to realize. We tend to think that we have not a subject here and an object there. But if they are somehow related, you get a different view of the voyeur. That is, the voyeur has a tendency to exhibitionism. OK, now, he claims that every voyeur is also an exhibitionist. And the biblical story, as I hope to show, supports this assumption. From shame, the two men, shame when they are alone, the two men, once the shame is overcome and the secret forced out of them, quickly reach agreement. It is this agreement that removes the obstacle and gives them the power to go about fulfilling their desire. That is, the minute they are together in their lust, there is no shame anymore, and they can go ahead. But at that moment, the mention is made of her alone. They made an agreement on the time when they would find her alone. So you have an opposition there. It seems significant that the men acquire their power in this particular way. Their high position, the power over life and death that they already had as judges, is not enough. They need to act in consultation. The moral support, because the shame is a moral uh, obstacle, the moral support they get from one another is the fictional representation of the cultural support that we talked about when we talked about rape that somehow the culture allows rape to be represented as its opposite. And therefore, it, men can get away with it, even if they are officially condemned when they are caught on the spot. And even if nobody will say, well, rape is not such a bad thing, everybody will be horrified by individual rape stories, yet somehow the culture encourages rape. Now, in the same sense, there is this moral cultural support that the men get out of their togetherness. And this uh, makes their power also fragile. And the fact that being together is a metaphor of being culturally supported. It breaks down as soon as each is alone. It is taken away from them when cunning young Daniel isolates them from one another later in the story. Then it's broken down. They are nowhere as soon as they are alone. Symmetrical to their combined power is their victim's powerlessness due to her isolation. As soon as the woman has sent her servants away, the men who, I quote, had hidden and were spying on her, run towards her and attack her. Alone, she has neither rescuer nor witness. Together, they have absolute power. So here is a very strong opposition in position. The word they use to confront her with their power is look. That's the first thing they say. And in Hebrew, in Biblical Hebrew, that word, look, hine, is a very frequent word used to establish um, reality, to confront the addressee with something that is real or true. It is used for an epistemological purpose, as an epi as epistemological statement in the Bible. So there is a very strong abuse here of the traditional meaning of that word. All the time the men were lusting after Susanna, but not yet acting, they were hidden and spying. And remember that in one of the two paintings, you don't see them, although they are there. It's like the, 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 the Joseph's penis. You just have to see them, or you won't see them. 
They were hidden and spying. Their position is emblematic of, the cons of that of the consumer of pornography, who is always hidden and spying, because never in eye contact with the woman they are looking at. And that's why this question of eye contact, either with the diegetic onlooker, the, 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 the representative for you, or with the viewer, is an issue in this question of pornography. Emblematic of the consumer of pornography's position, and by extension of all viewers of visual images. And this is not to suggest that all viewers of visual art are pornography lovers, of course. I'm saying that there is a similarity in position which makes it easy to use visual art for pornograph uh, pornographic purposes. And there is a continuity between the two positions. And it's easy to flip over from the one to the other. And so we have to, in each case of a visual representation that is potentially voyeuristic, we have to, to make the case and to see if, that is, if that's what's happening. Now, the position of the outsider who can look in without being seen in turn turns looking into spying. And therefore, the word spying is, is important here. The position of the voyeur has the comfort, the ease of invulnerability, and at the same time, the guilt that comes with this lack of commitment, this lack of self-exposure, this, this one-way traffic. The pleasure of invulnerability is either caused by or brings guilt. So there is a relation. That's why the, the shame is an issue. One hides because of guilt. Why would you hide if you're not guilty? Or you hide, and then you're guilty because you're hiding, unless one manages to receive community support for the hiding. But then, uh, the, the, I, I'm trying to say that if the culture accepts that hiding and spying is a normal thing, there is a paradoxical position, because if everybody would, if the community supports it, why would you hide? Why would you bother to hide? So the, the support is not total, because it does so only indirectly or rather metaphorically. The community stands by the elders. That's why they have to be elders and judges and have this absolute power position. The man's power is based on the assumption that they are honorable, decent elders. That is, they are secret spying. Although it is part of their position that they can do it, it is still something that is not overtly supported, but only hidden in hidden ways. The agreement between them concerns the fact that they are not honorable, decent elders. That's what they discover. That's what they are ashamed of. But once they discover it, they share it. And then they, the, the, the obstacle is removed. But the one, the, uh, the support inherent in their high social power is continuous with the other, their agreement to attack Susanna. Their togetherness is what makes it at all possible for them to envisage the attack. Until that togetherness is reached, there is no attack mentioned. There's just lust and the relation between viewing and lust, but no intention to act it out. Now, as in the Lucretia story, the men threatened to ruin Susanna's reputation of chastity, hence the honor of her husband. And this is the historical side to it that we try to get rid of today. But even today, in rape uh, trials, that is not necessarily removed. That is, as I said before, women who are married Get, have a higher chance of getting satisfaction in court than single women. Because the impl implicit assumption is that it's, it's worse to, to attack the honor of the husband, the property of the husband, than the, uh, the honor of the woman. Now, Lucretia's rapist threatened to denounce her with a slave, remember? And in some cases, with a black slave. And that was supposedly the utmost shame. And the victim yielded for the good of her husband's reputation. The logic cost her her life too bad. In Susanna's case, significantly, the threat is partly similar, partly different. If you refuse, we shall give evidence against you that there was a young man with you. And that was why you sent your maids away, because she had sent her maids away to get her things for her toilet. And so there is a young man brought in instead of the slave. Now, what is the difference between the slave, whose age is not specified, and a young man? And this is an interesting question. 
because the one yields and the other doesn't. So there must be a difference. Compared to the assailants, both are equally inferior in social status. As I said, the assailants owe their status to their age, the elders. The difference is not so much between the slave and the young man, but between the two directions, the direction taken by the shame that it brings to be denounced in that way. The slave affected the victim's status. He signified her fictitious lust as so forceful that it brought, brought her low to have intercourse with the slave is humiliating in itself for her. The young man evoked here, too, is brought in as a fiction, an embedded fiction. Everybody knows that there is no young man. On the level of the story's logic, as the most convincing evidence against Susanna's unassailable reputation. So to this extent, they are the same. But on another level, a more relevant le level in relation to voyeurism, he affects the status of the elders, the rivals of this fictive youth, more than he does hers. <coughs> and that's why she can resist. The young man represents for them the other side of voyeurism, the danger and attraction of exhibitionism. Right? The end of the story, this is, this is kind of a wild idea, but the end of the story makes this fiction about a young man literally come true when Daniel comes in. Why can Susanna stand firm where Lucrezia yielded? She can afford to because the men themselves introduce what is at stake, thus allowing her the logic of escape. The unconscious and implicit argument that I think underlies this difference would run as follows. First, Susanna is the more desirable since she is chaste, just like Lucrezia. It's the chastity combined with the beauty that makes her so attractive. But then secondly, she is desirable, and then the desire to act upon the desire makes it necessary that she have a desire of her own, because otherwise how she couldn't be available. And this is a contradiction. She has to be chaste, and she has to have a desire of her own. Now, what, what comes in then is that the men assume that she cannot desire them, because they are unattractive old men. How can she desire them? And here we see Potiphar standing there and watching this attractive young man. Hence, she must desire a young man who is so, more, so much more attractive than they are. And this is a resolution of the contradiction. Right? This young man brings in the resolution of this contradiction between her chastity and her desire. And then finally, since she has a desire for a young man, we can take her because she is available. She is not, her chastity is not iron. Now, the split between desire and action is now overcome by the acknowledgement of their own lack, right? But the lack remains. Acknowledging the lack doesn't mean that it disappears. And this lack introduces, introduces another unconscious line in the story. If the men are themselves setting up a dichotomy between old and young men, which they do, and interestingly, that's done more often in the Bible, that in relation to sexuality, the age difference is very often brought in. Now, if they are setting up this dichotomy between old and young men, there is more to it than the attractiveness for the woman. This must somehow affect them. Susanna can also afford to say no, because saying yes would challenge the man to perform as if they were young men. That is, they first set up the young man as the possible lover. But then if she would yield to them, they would suddenly be, they would suddenly be forced to overcome the lag and to, to give up their voyeur position for an actual lover's position. The suggestion here is that voyeurism may be related to real or feared impotence connected with age. And this is, of course, an ideological thing. I'm not saying that old men are impotent. But there is an ideology that claims that. And that, I think, is a way of compensating that is absolute power given to old men. Or in the other way, men want that power when they're old because that makes up for this ideology, ideological impotence. Now, one reason why not all pornography viewers set out to rape may also be that there is a relatively high rate of feared or real uh, impotence in that category. Although there is a contiguity 
in the sense of causality and almost local continuity between looking and touching, there is a, a radical discontinuity then between desire and fulfillment. And that brings in the need for fantasy, for hallucination. That absolute discontinuity needs to be respected and overcome. And that is where fantasy does the trick. But fantasy in a very strong sense. Now, the story reaches with this possible line a mood, in a sense really of a mood, an atmosphere, as close as fantasy as the Washington Joseph painting. You remember where you had this quality of this mood of fantasy as opposed to the other one that was much more realistic. Now, if this reading needs more, more textual support, this is provided by the men themselves in the scene of the trial when they establish an interesting connection between viewing and sexual potency. This textual support, however, is retrieved by a specific mode of reading of their account. Now, I read and I, I will emphasize the words that I'm talking about. Then a young man who had been in hiding came, this is the elders who speak, right? Then a young man who had been in hiding came and lay down with her. We were in a corner of the garden, and when we saw this wickedness, we ran up to them. Though we saw them in the act, we could not hold the man. He was too strong for us. And he opened the door and forced his way out. We seized the woman, etc. Now let me read this again just for the sake of clarity of which terms are relevant, and you, you see what I'm getting at. The young man, then a young man who had been hiding, came down and lay down with her, came and lay down with her. We were in a corner of the garden. When we saw this wickedness, we ran up to them. Though we saw them in the act, we could not hold them in. He was too strong for us. And he opened the door and forced his way out. We seized the woman, etc. We seized the woman. Now, this is very strange in terms of fantasy versus reality, you see. The passage can be read almost word for word and all those words that I underlined, especially, as a sincere account of what happened, but not in reality, but what happened to them, to the elders. If only we juxtapose the words as if they were hues of paint. That is, if we just ignore the sequence of the words as we tend to read them in verbal narrative, but just take them as blots, as an image. They describe the young man first in terms that identify him with them. Hiding, running up to her, opening the door, forcing her his way out or in maybe, and seizing her is what they did. And laying down with her is what they wanted and what they saw, as they say, we saw. They saw it hallucinating their fulfillment. And here is this hinge between voyeurism and rape. Is if the hallucination is strong enough, you confuse reality and, and fantasy. Now, the key phrase is, we saw them in the act, with the verb to see being a hinge between the two modes of perception, the reality of what happened and the fictional fantasy. Seeing is hardly the pretended innocent witnessing in this contest, the content, uh, context that they claim it is. I mean, they, the fact that they go to court doesn't mean that they are using the mode that should be used in court, the <coughs> mode of witnessing. They saw her while they were hiding. And as porno viewers, they desired and fantasized the act. They hallucinated the act performed by procreation in their stead by someone stronger than them. You see how the fear or the ideology of impotence and age is overcome by identification with the younger man. The hallucination, in fact, does come true. And that's the wonderful aspect of this story. It really happens because a devout young man named Daniel shows up and will be seen to act and overwhelm the elders, will be seen, indeed, to act and be stronger than them. He does so. How does he overwhelm them? By separating them, by bringing them back into the initial position of separation. Remember, it started out like that, and it ends up like that. This is precisely how he formulates his plan, apparently knowing where their power comes from. 
but is this young Daniel is a prophet precisely because he sees through the important issue here. Separate these two men and keep them at a distance from each other and I will examine them. Now if Daniel in the name of justice, truth and objectivity and these values, justice, truth, truth and objectivity are acquired by isolation of the subjects. That is the other way opposed to this intersubjectivity in Thomas Mount. In the name of justice, truth and objectivity, Daniel protests the innocence of the young man when he says, and we are here blood again, I will not have this woman's blood on my head. And it, which is a way of saying I did not do what I'm accused to do. That is a way of expressing his identification with the young man of the old man's fiction, right? <laughs> now, that expression in the context of the fantasized rivalry over the woman's possession can also carry this ambiguity that is all the time floating around. How can he be so sure of what happened since he wasn't there? If he, the fictive youth, putting himself in the position of the fictive youth of the lie, and the elders are not identified figures in a fantasy. By separating the old man and restoring Susanna's chastity for the public, restoring her veal, they take off her veal, right? He restores her veal of chastity, so to speak. He undoes the crime of the elders by traveling the same path backwards until, as a good psychoanalyst, he shows them that they have not really seen what they saw, that they had been hall hallucinating, right? That is what an analyst, an analyst does by showing the subject what, what the status is, the, what the reality status is of these fantasies. Now, separating them from each other, he confronts them with the unbridgeable gap between the young men they created and themselves, now without power as without potency. So he's traveling back and see, you know, you post yourself this gap by inventing the young man. And so become a, a voyeur again, that's okay, but don't go further than that. In their hallucinated fantasy, they created Daniel. This is true not only in their fantasy, but also for their fantasy, in the narrativization of that fantasy. Because without their lie, and here the narrative aspects is interesting, without their lie, Daniel, the young man, would not exist as a character, would not have to intervene, would not have to be evoked nor would he become the hero he has become, thanks to the elders' evocation of him. That is, in all senses of the word, they create him. And this is true also on the level of the story's logic, since it is their lie that necessitates his narrative existence. See, if you, if you take the narrative as what generates the next step, there wouldn't be a Daniel without this invention of the young man. Now, this is a a reading that is plausible in the light of this theory of voyeurism. It is not a narrative reading in the traditional sense, nor is it, of course, a historical reading. We're not talking about historical reading where uh, I think the story was much more used for moral and theological and juridical aspects. Semiotically speaking, its plausibility is strong, however, because it is a visual reading. It is visual in two ways. It brackets the chronology of the story, and it works by skimming over the elements of the text as a viewer of a painter skims over the surface. That is, in a painting, you don't have that chronology, that sequentiality that you have in a narrative. But it is possible, as I hope to have shown, to read verbal narrative as if it were a visual work. That is, by just picking elements and see them as blots, as cues that create, that produce a reading. And the, in the second sense, it's visual because it works on the assumption that the men are hallucinating as continuous with their voyeurism, the fulfillment of their desire. That is, the visuality produces the fulfillment. And that's another way to say this is a visual reading. These two ways may seem so far totally different in status. The first one affects the actual work of the reader. And the second one introduces a thematic, an isotopy, 
the psychoanalytic view of voyeurism as exposed by Freud in his essay into the reading. So there's a different level. But the two are related by the narrative strategy which represent voyeurism through focalization. And now we have to talk a little bit about that. I promised you yesterday that we would. And although I intended to postpone that to the next time, I think maybe I'll come back to it next time. It's important to see these uh, aspects. Now, I, you know, I introduced the term focalization. It, I didn't introduce it. Jeanette introduced it first, but didn't work it out in the way that I then decided to work it out. It was introduced to replace the cumbersome and ambiguous term of point of view. And I explain in the blue book why this is a better term. Its use for visual art has to be discussed, however, because it comes out of a, the theory of narrative as a verbal art. That is, um, in this story, I will claim that focalization is on the one hand different, but on the other hand coincides with the voyeurism of the elders, according to the episodes. And so what I want to do now is to briefly sum up the visual, let's say, a visual reading of the concept of focalization. Did you read the, the chapter here in the, in the book? If you didn't, you had better, because it's, uh, I'm going to rely on it a, a lot. Now, first of all, in narrative discourse, focalization is the direct content of the linguistic signifiers. In visual art, it is, if we may make the analogy, it is the direct content of the visual signifiers like lines, dots, light and dark, and composition. So the first, th the first thing you get if you analyze those signs is the focalization that then sheds a specific light on the story. In both cases, focalization is, of course, already an interpretation. And that is why this uh, Garrett's remarks on the tradition of the Susanna painting uses and implicitly uses this idea that the same, so-called same story, can be completely reversed just by giving it a different focalization. Now, secondly, in narrative, we have, and we talked about this yesterday, an external focalizer, in principle identifiable with the narrator, that is, the, the focalizer who is not part of the, the fabula, from which it is distinguished in function, not in identity, that is, a primary external narrator focalizer is one identity, but two functions. The one, the function of speech, and the other, the function of, of focalization. This external focalizer can embed an internal, diegetic one. The relation of embedding, then, is important. So this is why this concept works better than point of view, because then you have this kind of idea of juxtaposition, external, internal, never mind, it's just done the one and then the other. But there is an embedding of the internal one within the external one that is important. Now, in visual art, how does this work? We have the, the same distinction as we saw yesterday between the position that starts at the external end of the frame with this uh, phallic symbol, and on the other hand, Joseph's internal uh, view, which was technically <coughs> embedded in the external. That is, therefore, it was a fantasy of the father embedding the desire of the son as a hypothesis. And this is important here for the elders, too. So they do not meet on the same level. And to a certain extent, the focalization of Joseph is entirely contingent upon the fantasy of this external focalizer, identified with Potiphar in the action. We have seen the same structure in this uh, biblical uh, story, and I'll come back to it, where the very existence of young Daniel is produced by the focalization of the elders. And that's why this principle of embedding is crucial. If you don't realize that, you're going to think just that there is the elders and then there's Daniel, and you don't see the connection. Now, in narrative, third point, the fabula, or diegesis, let's say, the, the series of events, is considered to be mediated, or even produced, I'd say, by the focalizer. Similarly, in the case of visual art, the use of the concept implies the claim that the event <laughs> Comparison in the comparison between the two, two Joseph paintings we did yesterday. We saw, for example, that Joseph as a character received a different status in each. In the one he was there, in the other one he was an image. He was really present, hence melodramatic in the Berlin painting, fantasized 
by the internal focalizer, Spotify and his wife and the other. And that made the crucial difference between the painting in the, in the structural sense. Now, the status of the figure in the second case was suspended, leaving room for different interpretations. And you see here that the mediation, the embedding, is really a concept that you need in order to, to play with this in a, in a subtle way. Now, as a consequence of this last point, the same object or event can receive different interpretations according to different focalizers. And the, the famous case of Madame Bovary, you know that case where Emma has blue eyes in one passage and black eyes in another, gray eyes, dark eyes, and brown eyes. Now, how is that possible in a realistic novel? Now, that's possible because they are, the eyes are variable according to the internal focalizer with whom we watch her. We have seen how in the Joseph etching on uh, the one object, the woman's body, was represented in two different and in fact incompatible ways according to the two different focalizers, one of whom was internal and one hinging between internal and external. And that's, this was so strong that we got a sense that there were in fact two half bodies rather than one body. That is, the, the actual object does not really exist. You, all you have is the focalization. Now, in narrative discourse, the identification of external focalizer with an internal one can produce a discursive conflation that we call free and direct discourse. You know what that is, right? Now, free and direct discourse is a typical narrative and supposedly modern narrative device in visual art, you can also have free and direct discourse, as I tried to claim yesterday, which is an identification between an external focalizer with an internal focalizer represented in the image. You get the same conflation. Would um, Lucretia um, remember be an example of that? Yeah, yes. Where we are. Yes, well, yeah. And that brings about this very strong identification uh, discursively. You use the language of the character even. And that is how we can detect uh, free and direct discourse in, in literature, because the language is different. And here the, the visual language is different. Now, so as a, this is not only a case for the use of vocalization in visual art, but also a case of the, for the use of the word text for visual art. This is typically textual thing that the, the status of the represented object can change radically according to the representation's text, texture. Now, let's say these are the points in which I think focalization is an important visual device. And if we keep that in mind, we can go back to the Daniel story and see um, how the overall focalizer, whose view is directly rendered by the narrative voice, let's say the the first primary point of view. It, it is distanced from the elders. It's not the case that we have here the story of the elders. We have an, a distance, external focalizer, obvious in evaluative passages, which begin as early as the introduction of the two men. And this is important to keep in mind, because I'm going to claim that this obvious ideologically okay perspective does not preclude the voyeuristic perspective. On the contrary, it justifies it in a way because it, it reassures you ideologically. For example, when the narrator says, talking about the trial scene, she was closely veiled, but those scoundrels ordered her to be unveiled so that they may feast their eyes on her beauty. You have a passage in which the narrator is of the the narrator is uh, taking the focalization. The, those scoundrels is something that distances us from the for years, but the implication that seeing her is a feast for the eyes is not taking that distance. So that's embedding the other perspective. And this passage is immediately followed by and contrasted with her family and all who saw her were in tears. So what you have here is the external focalization embeds two possibilities. You can either feast your eyes or be in tears when you see her. And although there cannot be any doubt that explicitly the overall focalizer stands on the side of the righteous, 
the other possibility is evoked. I mean, feast is a verb that implies that pleasure that is in fact at stake. Now, only when vocalization is embedded and the elders are assigned the power to present uh, their own vocalization, then vocalization comes to take the specific form of male voyeurism. But you can see in this kind of sentence that there are all these, uh, there are all these little hinges where you have already the possibility of siding there. And, but then at that point, it's not, it's, there is this official status of the text as um, OK, right? And of course, the biblical context gives this a legitimation. And my, my, well, I have this book, Death and the Symmetry, about the Book of Judges, where I have this very cynical view of the Bible, I say. The fact that this is a biblical context makes us buy the most horrible story and makes us think that they are allegorical. Because what else could they be in a biblical context? Now, the murder, rape, and dismemberment of the woman that I evoked in the, the Lucretia uh, section in Judges 19 is a horrible story of the rape and dismemberment, murder, uh, gang rape, whatever, of an innocent woman. Whatever allegorical interpretation the biblical context proposes to us to be reassured and I think it's important to keep in mind that you have these different vocalizations as possibilities proposed. And you can have your voyeuristic pleasure and your pornographic pleasure with biblical stories if you want to. If you choose to do so, you can. And I even claim that that was part of the whole game of using folk tales within a religious context. Now, the passage of the hallucinated wish fulfillment is a rather long one in which the elders narrate their version of the story. And here we have this embedded structure that leaves open the question to what extent the story as a whole works pornographically. But remember that the passage that I quoted where they evoke this young man stronger than they is a passage where, first of all, we identify the language is very strange there and very powerful. We are asked, invited to identify with the elders, with the voyeurs. But then you also have the possibility to identify with the young man. The young man who is then later going to be the one who saves the chastity and who saves the woman, etc. But he's also the one who forces his way. So there are various positions that you can take, some of which are at the side of the woman or the side of the righteous young man. But the two others are at the side of the voyeuristic rapists and as the, at the side of the hallucinated successful lover. So there are, in fact, two distinct voyeur positions, pornographic positions, and then two distinct positions at the other side that you can take. Yeah, the crowd. Well, we have on the one hand this sentence about the, to feast their eyes. By implication, everybody can feast their eyes in the crowd. On the other hand, those who saw her, her family and all those who saw her weeped, uh, wept and, and were distressed with tears in their eyes. So here again, we have two possible positions. The crowd can take the side of the, of the voyeurs and enjoy the sight of this beauty as a publicly available thing or they can side with her and weep for her, etc. And so I'm not claiming that the whole story is a piece of pornography, but I'm claiming that it, you have your choices, and you have your pornographic choice. You can do it if you like. And that is um, disturbing enough on the one hand, but we have to be realistic enough to know that that is the case. But then that also implies that you have your choice and that you're not just drawn into a position, that you can take the position where you want it. And I think understanding this elderly man, fear of impotence for your reason, and the, the fear of the young rival, understanding that makes it easier to address the issues where they really are, rather than buy into a voyeuristic uh, game. Now, Mary Garrard wrote about the irony that Susanna, the model of chastity, has become in painting a celebration of sexual opportunity. And 
Gerard rightly emphasizes the differences because in the painterly tradition, this becomes entirely one-sided. So there is a difference. And since she is only interested in the paintings, her judgment is helpful and justified. But if we examine the story in a more detailed way, as detailed as she did for the paintings, and for, at least for Artemisia's painting, we must come to a different conclusion. The story in the Bible is not as innocent. And although the biblical story relies in moral terms on the biblical context in which morality and theology always frame the stories, however disturbing they may otherwise be, and again I refer to Genesis 19 to see how disturbing they can be, I contend that the Susanna story holds the, the germs of a pornographic flavor, which then later becomes its sole motivation in the painterly tradition. That is, I would claim there's more continuity between the biblical story and the painterly tradition than uh, Gerard claims. She tends to blame the painterly tradition, hence the, the whole Christian tradition. But I think it's not that simple. That is not such a clear opposition. In the hallucinatory quality of their account lies the implicit pornographic aspect of the biblical story. The fact that this invocation of the elders at the trial has this quality of hallucination, of linking up all these aspects in a visual way, the young man who they bring in, whom they bring in as an invention, as a fiction, then turns out to be necessary to make the story, to bring the story to an end. That quality implies the possibility of this uh, pornographic position. And since that account was both visually based and visually readable, yet verbally produced, we cannot assume, and this is an important aspect of this whole discussion, we cannot assume that pornography is a priori a visual matter. And you know that there, are, there is purely verbal pornography. There's a whole industry of pornographic stories that do, don't need images. Neither are pornography and visuality unrelated. And here, that's why pornography is an interesting debate if we talk about verbal, visual, media, and what exactly the status is of each in relation to eroticism. There is an interrelation between the two, but it lies in the mode, in the mode in the sense of the affirmative, interrogative, subjunctive modes. It lies in the mode rather than in the medium of visuality. Right? The possibility of pornography, based as it is on voyeurism, in verbal representation is evidence for the visuality of verbal representation. That is, I'm saying that Voyeurism is something visual, right? Clearly, I mean, it's, the word says it. It's a visual thing. But you don't need images for it. You don't need concrete physical images. You can do it with words because words can be visual. It's the visual quality of the words that make it possible to do pornography in words. And so, let's so say that... Yeah? No, let's say... Pornography as the literary or visual mode that evokes, that creates, produces um, voyeurism. Yes, that relies upon voyeurism to be attractive. Pornography is the, the genre, and voyeurism is the attitude. All right? Yeah? OK? OK, that's what I wanted to bring up today. Yes. <laughs> 